Henry Kissinger was interviewed recently saying that we need to really watch out for military tensions between the U.S. and China, and that's something I would guarantee 90 percent of people, maybe more in America, they think everything's rosy. I know. It's just, it's just been so good for the last, you know, 20-plus 20, right. 20 years. How could, how, could, how could that ever happen? Right. So the, the, the buildup of these forces has been observable, but uh, was getting feels like it got closer to a tipping point with Trump versus China. But, you know, it's, 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 I, I think all of these things are the same thing being expressed in, in, in different places of the global society. So one signpost along the road, and I'll go right back to it again, is the exodus from California. I mean, they kept doing these policies. They, they kept ladling them on year after year. The taxes were going up. The, the infrastructure was, was let, allowed to crumble. They were closing down reservoirs. They kept uh, decreasing the maintenance of the state forests, which is largely responsible for the yeah. size and number of fires. People like to just say global warming, but it's also forest maintenance in a big way. And a lot of these forests, they should have been uh, cut down out these dead trees, but there were environmentalist interests that said, oh, we, they're habitat for, you know, the ash borer beetle or something, you know, and we can't, we can't let that beetle, uh, you know, not have its habitat. And so instead we have hundreds and thousands of acres, millions of acres that are burning down. Well, now the, the tipping point seems to have been reached and people are leaving. And now they're even talking about building uh, a, uh, a, a, a <laughs> I won't say a wall, but it's a, it's a uh, legislatural, if that's a word, legislational law, wall, to keep you in California. They don't want you to leave. They're saying that if you, they're, they're, they're banding around the idea that if you leave California, you have to pay the wealth tax for 10 years. It's ridiculous. Right? So they're, they're essentially going to build a wall. You're not allowed to, uh, an economic wall, if you will. You're not allowed to leave. But the, pe the people will leave. And, and the more dictatorial your policies are and the more heavy-handedly you start treating those uh, people that have been too lazy or uh, I don't know too much inertia to leave uh, you're, you're, you're gonna you're gonna turn them off too so the tax base in a lot of these states is being um, is being pushed out and it's being pushed out at a time when those tax revenues are really needed for things like, we really need water projects in California. We certainly need uh, better, uh, better roads and infrastructure and bridges. But uh, the, the very fact that they've neglected them is going to be is a causation for uh, lacking the wherewithal to fix them when you wake up and realize what all of these issues accumulate to. And I think you can expand it out. It's, it's kind of like I, when I was a kid at the, at the um, Buffalo Science Museum, they had this great exhibit, I still remember it uh, today, where they took a microscope, a really high powered, and what you kind of see when you look at molecules and stuff, and then they kept zooming out and, and then getting to a bigger and bigger view until they got to a telescope looking out at the sky at night, and it looked exactly the same as the molecules. <laughs> it's like all the same, it just depends on what level you're analyzing and thinking. And all of these things fit together, so it goes. It goes from, you know, the the the, the attitude of of the the, the millennials and, and and Gen Zs and all that, and it goes to the relationship between China and the United States, and it goes to the relationship between reserve currencies, which which will come, and all, all this is happening. And it's it's. F I think it's getting to the point where more people will start to realize, and will start uh, acting. Uh, in, in a way that starts to usher in at what Neil Howe How calls the fourth turning. And to be prepared for it, you have to be more weirdly diversified than ever, ever before. The idea of a 60-40, all United States, 60% S&P 500, 40% Treasury bonds, that just seems largely inappropriate for the type of tail risk that seems likely in, and I'm not talking next quarter, but I but I'm, I'm certainly feel like by 2027. 
So I said in 2016, if you think this is a weird election, wait till 2020. I, I think it's the, the factor of weirdness from the jump from 2016 to 2020 will be far exceeded by the delta of weirdness from 2020 to 2024. Uh, it seems almost certain that some sort of progressive slate is going to have substantial support. It was already pretty substantial this year. So after the fourth turning, there's, you, you kind of reset. So first turning. So let's, you get, you get well, to the let's first talk turn. about something positive now. To, it's the greatest thing ever. I mean, the, 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 the first turning, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a cleansing process. You're, 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 you're treating the disease. You know, it's, you're, you're finally treating the disease. And, and what happens is you get, uh, uh, once there's an awareness of, of how the situation must be dealt with with significant change, the path to that change is actually not, doesn't have to be that bad. It's just that everybody has to agree. One, one potential thing you could actually, I mean, it's, I'm not predicting this, but you could split the U.S. into two countries and, you know, they could end up uh, having their rules and everybody likes them and they, they might even get along. Um, so you end, up with, you, you end up with phenomenal opportunity and phenomenal harmony, uh, but, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a cycle, and I just deeply believe in, in this, this, this framework for analyzing history because it, it kind of explains many things that have happened um, in the United States history, and you can look to other civilizations even. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be rough, but you have to um, you know, you deal with the, the cards that you're dealt. And again, I, I, I strongly suggest, um, I, I'm even, I've even been bullish on Bitcoin this year. And I, in my Just Markets webcast in January, I said one of my highest convictions ideas, highest conviction ideas is that Bitcoin will go to, and I said maybe even 15,000 here in 2020. And it got off to a slow start, but boy, is it made up for it. I mean, I think it's at 19,000 yeah, today. It's almost near its... Uh, almost at the 2017 yeah. high. And Bitcoin is really interesting because it's a really great speculation vehicle. You can tell me all you want about the potential uses for it economically and all that stuff, and uh, that's all well and good, and I don't really, I'm not an expert on that, but it is an incredible speculation vehicle because the volatility is so monumental. So, you know, the, the Bitcoin could, you know, if you want it to be more, uh, you know, less uh, traditional, you could probably buy some of this Bitcoin stuff for the 25% of your portfolio, yeah, yeah or, or or mix it together. I I don't I, I don't really um, I'm suspicious of Bitcoin, but I'm I'm not a cult Bitcoin person, but I'm not a hater either. I'm I'm agnostic, but I, as a, as a, a person that watches markets and volatility and speculation opportunities, that's a good one. <laughs>we got some uh, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I'd like to run some, run through. Um, first question, we're going to have potentially another chairman of the Fed coming in, yeah. depending on, we'll see who wins. We don't know yet, right? We don't, we don't yeah. know yet. What advice would you give that next chairman? Um, it's kind of hopeless. Close for down the Fed. <laughs> uh, was, that was Jim Grant's answer at a conference I gave. He, and he gave it in you know, a, a millisecond because he's such a quick wit. But, you know, the Fed should stop bailing out the market, just broadly speaking. The, the, the Fed has to, should stop pretending that they're doing anything other than bailing out the market. And when they, when they admit that they've been bailing out the market, then they should stop doing it. I, I think they should let the economy act in, you know, a traditional sense that you allow bankruptcies to happen, that you allow recessions to eliminate debt. One of the reasons we have so much debt is the, that we, we coddle it. We don't, we don't let the restructurings happen. And that's another reason why we have a lot of these economic problems. An, again, it's an, another prism through which to see these distortions in the way the economy has been managed. And the, the Fed should, should stop uh, doing all of this manipulation, but um, that's not gonna happen. Yeah. It's easier to just continue the status quo, right? Yeah, they don't want they don't they they don't want the big change to be ushered in on their watch. I think what a Fed chairman person chair, chairwoman in Yellen's case wants 
is to survive their chairmanship, and nobody said you blew the thing up. <laughs> that's, that's probably goal number one yeah. if you st step into the shoes of the Fed chairman. But in a certain sense, the Fed should, um, they, they, they should take away the punch bowl when the party gets too raucous, as one of the Fed chairmen uh, back, one of the mo more traditional, truly um, laissez-faire type Fed chairman actually said. And it was, I don't, can't remember which one it was, it was so long ago. But they, they, they should not play um, arsonist and fireman, which is, they, they're kind of arsonist by day, fireman by night. I guess the only f Fed chairman who really rocked the boat was Volcker, right? Volcker did, and I, I can't remember his name. It's like McChesky or something like that. Those two were really good. Volcker was, Volcker was just incredible. I mean, to to come in, and basically say, I am going to raise rates to twenty percent, so we get uh, an actual real rate versus what's an elevated inflation rate, so we can get rid of this inflation cycle, and the recession was really brutal. I remember 1982. I, I was just out of school, and I got. I was working at an insurance company, and I was there for three months. The calendar year turned, and I got an 18 percent cost of living pay raise. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't a review. It was everybody got an 18 percent cost of living pay raise, just because the inflation was so high. Uh, so yeah, we need the Fed to. Uh, to to um, get 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 away from being arsonist and firefighter. You know, you you, you spoke a lot about all these changes that are going to come. We've been stuck in this this the same world almost, the same regime for it seems like 20, 30 years. You, you told me a story once about when you got into the business. Now that you're talking about the early 80s, where you were in this regime where people thought rates were going higher forever and ever, and that they yeah. could only go higher, and nobody thought rates could fall. I and now I feel like we're in the opposite end of that. Nobody thinks rates can rise. Right. And I remember when Treasury rates went below 10 percent. They had been, on the 10-year, had been at 14 in the end of May of 1984. And they went below 10 percent. And everybody thought that it was kind of, a, kind of a psychosis. Like, why would anybody like, take a single-digit bond yield? And then they went down to 8. And then they went down to six, and people thought six was just, you, you had to rub your eyes. You couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I remember when the two-year treasury was at three, and people just thought that it was just unacceptably low. And you're exactly right. Now it's exactly the opposite. That rates can't rise. In fact, I've, I've heard people say s those exact words in newspaper articles and on financial TV. Rates can never rise. Yeah, they can, um, but the Fed might try to stop it. They did that in the 40s and the into the 50s when we had a very high debt to the GDP because of the World War II debt. Uh, and then, well, once they stopped the yield curve control, we went into a 25-year bear market in bonds that took yields from 2.5 to over 15. Um, the Fed let that happen because they weren't doing you know, creative quantitative easing types of stuff. The, the Fed, you know, they've said they'll do large-scale asset purchases, but I don't think they'll do it unless the market starts to get them worried, and it's clear that the yields there today don't have them worried. So what, what rate do you think that is? I don't think it's that high. I, I think if you got, I think if you got the ten-year over two, move into three, I, I think they, that would at least give them pause, and they, they might start you know, with a big QE program, but we'll see. I mean, they want, I'll give the Fed credit for one thing, and that is they understand the compounding problem of our debt, and they want the inflation rate higher than the interest rate. That's a slow motion devaluation of, you know, debasement mm -hmm. of the debt. We already have average hourly earnings, where I said at the outset, the data is, doesn't have the right context because the mix shift of the huge jump in unemployment. But average hourly earnings growth for what that number is worth, uh, is higher than the 30-year mortgage rate. So no wonder housing's doing well. People kind of look at it and say, if they believe that these pay increase, uh, this path of pay increases is durable, well, your out-of-pocket versus your take-home, your out-of-pocket for your mortgage versus your take-home is declining. 
if, if you're getting raises yeah, that are in excess yeah. of your mortgage rate. So we actually have slow motion debt debasement going on right now. I mean, if the inflation rate gets up to two and a half on the headline CPI and, and through the broad economy, which certainly the Fed wants, and rates stay where they are, well, then we're actually lessening the debt burden of corporate America. Investment grade corporate bonds on average yield one seven. So if you get the inflation rate to two five, well, then you don't have a corporate debt problem. It's, it's getting a little bit better every year. Yeah. So yeah, rates can definitely rise, and they have risen. I mean, the, 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 the yield from the intraday low during the teeth of the, of the panic uh, on the 30-year Treasury, is, it is up 100 basis points from that. I mean, the loss is like 25%. Yeah, we got down to 0.71. Yeah. 0.71 was the intraday low, and we're basically sitting about 100 basis points higher. And uh, I have a hard time figuring out, other than people that are following my 25, 25, 25, 25 asset allocation that would then have some 30-year treasuries in there, not out of value, but out of tail risk hedge. You know, other than them, I have a hard time figuring out who wants them. Certainly foreigners don't want our long-term treasuries. They've been selling for years, and they've, that selling has accelerated over the past 18 months. Uh, do pensions want long-term treasuries at 1.7 you know, when their funding rate is 7%? I doubt it. Uh, so what does that leave? It leads the Fed and my 25, 25, 25 <laughs> people. <laughs> and so the rates should be going higher. Yeah, it seems like they are. Um, so since starting Double Line 10 years ago, what are you most proud of in terms of the team and the firm's accomplishments? Um, I like the firm's culture. Uh, I like that we don't compete with ourselves. I like that um, we have so many people that can provide thought leadership, uh, including you and Sherman. You know, you do this channel and, and Sherman and uh, the other people that um, do TV appearances and I do a lot of webcasts and speeches. And I'm pretty sure that when they say the word double line guest is coming up next, that the volume goes up at many trading rooms and many, uh, many places. And I know the ratings go up because they always want us to go on. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm proud of our, thought, of our thought leadership. I'm proud of um, the way that um, we interact with the platforms for whom we sub-advise. One of the things, I'll, I'll just give you a concrete example. I uh, gave a big speech um, one of these places where there were like 2,500 people, and they had s one of our uh, partners that we sub-advise for introduce me. And oftentimes they read my bio, which is really kind of cringeworthy. You know, they talk about, you know, they talk about like 1977 or something, like who cares? But this person gave a very creative and brief uh, uh, this, uh, introduction of how she c had come to know me. And then she said, well, well, one of the things we really like about Double Line is they're so great to work with. When we work with a partner like that, their people are great, they're so responsive, we enjoy working with them so much. And I think that that is reflective of a, of a, a culture of collaboration. And I like the way in which we have managed to go from you know, 45 people wearing multiple hats to now nearly 300 people without, a, without much volatility, right? Without big crises, without, uh, our AUM went from zero to, to you know, 140 billion plus dollars, and we didn't have anything blow up. Um, no strategy, you know, we had a lot of market volatility. So we, we have, we've, we've stewarded the thing pretty well. Um, I just, you know, I just wish that I could uh, like rewind and relive it and just enjoy it 100% instead of only 70% and worry the other 30% of the time. Yeah, I hear you. What's your favorite activity these days outside of work? Wow, uh, I don't think it's changed very much. I, I uh, Doing yoga still? I do yoga less than I used to. I do uh, more weights now. Uh, I, I do uh, my rowing machine. I, I do go on walks, which is nice because you want to get out from yeah. the house. Um, so I do that, and I, I enjoy that. I still still like doing puzzles, I, I, uh, and uh, I've actually been writing songs. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I've, I've actually uh, got a setup now in my music room. I've got, you know, some amplification and all this stuff. And I've actually written, I, 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 I'm, I'm a pretty harsh critic of the things that I do creatively. Like, draw, I, I can't draw to save my life, uh, but I can write songs pretty well. And so I've, I've been doing that, and uh, I'm always interested in following, you know, just the, the, the news cycles. I enjoy just watching the news and interpreting it, and I like following the art world. I'll never, that's just in my DNA. Has that changed because of COVID? Is, is uh, yes, uh, uh, the major auction houses are now very different. They're all virtual. Um, the, the market is uh, kind of reeling, I would say. Uh, people can't uh, preview live art. And so the auctions have gotten kind of weird. They've gotten more global. Um, but they're still they're still moving the stuff. Yeah, you uh, believe prices should be strong given risk assets are doing so well. People feel, uh, feel good. Art, the, art, the art market is very uneven, and it has been uneven since 2007. Every part of the art market was booming in the build up to the global financial crisis, uh, and then the, the global financial crisis really uh, hit the values of low, middle, and lower end. Uh, of art. Now, when I say middle, I'm talking like, let's say $500,000. And, and when I say lower end, I'm talking about stuff that still costs money. I'm not talking about something at, a, at an art fair, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a, you know, the, the Laguna Art Fair or something like this. I'm talking about $25,000. Those, a lot of those things are down substantially and they've never, they've never rallied. It's the very high end. It's the trophy stuff. It's, it's, um, I think it has a lot to do with the emergence of new wealth in China and Russia that doesn't trust their their currency and they like things that they can move around yeah uh, that you can move around very concentrated value and uh, so uh, I, I follow that I, I enjoy that stuff couldn't couldn't get away without a football question sure uh, I know Jeffrey is a football fan which teams do you think are gonna go to the Super Bowl this year other than the Bills. <laughs> well, I don't think this is the Bills year, although they're certainly taken a huge step forward over the past c couple of years. Um, uh, I'm going to go with, and I don't think there's much insight in this, I, I'm going to go with Kansas City. Yeah, I was going to say KC looks strong. Yeah, and I'm going to go, oh boy, I'm going to go, the NFC is sort of tough. Um, uh, I'm thinking of Seattle for the NFC. Pete Carroll, but, my boy. Yeah, Pete Carroll, had the, he's going to go down in history as the worst play call in the history of the NFL, not running Marshawn Lynch yeah. on second and, and less than a yard, uh, uh, second down, less than a yard with a timeout, and a touchdown ends the game, and he, th and he threw it. Yeah, uh, he's, he's a strange coach because he doesn't, he doesn't seem to play the odds very well. He play, seems to play yeah, on He's hunches. very emotional. He did win one. Yeah. Um, staying on sports for a second, it's weird without the crowds. The Masters just happened at an odd time of the year. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's worse, Tiger Woods 10 on that par 12? Uh, par, sorry, par 3 hole 12 or the Greg Norman meltdown? Oh, the Greg, mel <laughs> the Greg Norman meltdown is just epic. <laughs> I mean, Tiger was out of contention. It didn't matter. It's it's an embarrassment, but it made no difference. Yeah. He was. I mean, the guy that won was 20 under. Um, so, uh, but the Greg Norman thing, it was really eerie because I think he started five strokes ahead, and it wasn't very far into the round that you could just tell that something wasn't going to happen quite right here, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and. He couldn't hit a fairway. I mean, it was just, it was just so, so brutal to watch. It was, uh, I would say the two worst meltdowns in golf history that I've experienced were the Greg Norman thing, and I think it was the British Open, this guy Van de Waal, who was ahead. All he had to do was, I think, double bogey the 18th or something. He was going to win. And it was a very t weird 18th hole where it wasn't prudent to use a driver, even if you needed, you know, to to power it or whatever. But to 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 pull out the driver, and then he ended up 
in a, in a playoff. He had, I think he triple bogeyed or something. He ended up in a playoff. And of course, th after that, he couldn't recover and he ended up <laughs> losing. But it was, it was like almost a guaranteed win. It was just like the Pete Carroll thing. It was like a guaranteed win. That's what they used, that's used to call snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. Has working from home hurt helped your creativity and production at the firm? Um, I would say it's probably helped creativity in certain areas like um, some of the programs we've started to put in place to pr provide content for investors and particularly our clients. Uh, it's motivated us to do um, new outreach to clients. We've, we've, we have one that's coming up shortly that I think clients will really like. Um, I'm not going to uh, spill the beans here. Um, but I think creativity um, in, in terms of day-to-day -day work interaction has taken a little bit of a hit. Because while we do endless teams meetings, you know, we have an executive committee meeting every day, and investment committee meetings, and total return meetings, and you know, op income meetings, and all this stuff, what you don't have is, you, I read an article on a wire, and it, it just surprises me, or, or triggers me uh, creatively, and I walk over to an investment team, and we start talking about it very spontaneously. And it can go sometimes over an hour because it's an important idea or something that maybe we hadn't thought of before. That type of conversation is less. But it, communication broadly, I would say, while it's a little bit more formulaic, is probably higher. Yep. I think it's higher. And I've also learned um, a new analysis, a new way, it, it's, it's provided a new way to analyze uh, what people are doing at the company. Because when you work through a verticality of an organization, where you have a team leader, and you go to the team leader and say, I need this, and the team leader delegates it, and then it comes back to the team leader to me, I'm not really sure who's doing the work. And in many cases, the team leader wants to take credit for it. And when you start doing things virtually, I send it out not to the team leader, I send it to the team. Because if, the, we, you know, if you have these shortcuts, and sure, you yeah. send, send it to you know, the MBS team. And it's interesting to see who gets back to you on what and how quickly. And it's interesting to see how there are some people that, do they still work here? Um, maybe they shouldn't. Because <laughs> you, know, you, you get to see where the productivity is from a different angle. Um, it, 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 might, it might corroborate what you saw previously, and it might contradict it. And so that, that's been really interesting. Uh, but I do think productivity has gone up due to not having to commute. Oh, absolutely. And I think there's I a think lot I of I think I work more now than I I think people are working longer hours yeah. than, they, than they were. Not, and and that's not, that, that doesn't mean just adding on the, com the, 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 the commute time. I mean, if they commuted at 7 you know, and they got home at 5, in, in the old days, I have a feeling that they're probably starting work at seven, and maybe they take a break in the afternoon. But I've had people they they, they call me up and I say, "What are you doing?" It's like six thirty p.m. I say, I'm working. Well, there's I feel like we lack the psychological disconnection from work when you leave the physical presence of the office. You take your drive. You're you know yeah. you're, you're 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 leaving work or you're coming to work. It's like I wake up and I know what you mean. I'm at work. I, I know what you mean. I you're right. There's this physicality aspect of it where you leave. And you know you, s some of your 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 work is left behind, and now I almost feel guilty if I'm not working all the time. It's weird because I don't you don't have yeah. that that you you're, you're right that kind of physicality barrier. Yeah, there's also a lot going on in the markets. Inter interesting times. There were. I mean, I thought uh, March and April and May were just in, into June really. That was that was exciting. I mean, it was it was kind of brutal, but it was exciting. I mean, to, to see that type of volatility. And uh, I got a feeling we're going to see it again. We'll see. And 2020 not, not is coming along. Not terribly distant future. All right. Well, thanks so much for making time. It was great to have you on. And uh, I'm sure our listeners uh, enjoyed it. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Ken. All right.